Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Novak. I am a professor of Jewish studies and uh, philosophy here at the University of Toronto. And we welcome you to this webinar uh, in our lecture series of the Antan and Downbaum uh, Center for Jewish Studies here at uh, U of T. Uh, we are very fortunate to, today to have as our guest lecturer, Professor Suzanne Lastone Stone, uh, who is the University Professor of Jewish Law and Contemporary Civilization at Yeshiva University and Professor of Law and Director of the Center for Jewish Law and Contemporary Civilization at Cardoza Law School of Yeshiva University. Uh, professor Sedone is a, a distinguished scholar, um, having uh, held uh, visiting professorships at, uh, at Harvard, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Columbia, Hebrew University, Tel Aviv University, uh, and her publications are uh, impressive to put it mildly. Uh, I would like to enter a, a personal note. Suzanne Stone is, 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 is an old friend and colleague of, of, of mine. Um, I remember when she was a lecturer in the Tikva Fund uh, summer program at Princeton University about 12 years ago when I used to uh, direct it. And we would bring in outstanding scholars in uh, Jewish studies generally uh, to lecture to these very, very bright uh, undergraduates. Uh, and Suzanne Stone uh, topped the list of, the, of their favorites. Uh, not only her knowledge, but the way she engaged the students uh, and her passion for her work and uh, her genuine interest in communication was something that uh, was a, a joy to, uh, to, to behold. Professor Stone is going to speak to us the, this afternoon uh, on the topic norms and narrative. Now norms and narrative is a important title because norms and narrative translate into uh, rabbinic parlance as norms being halakha and narrative being agada. Uh, in the Talmud, the discussions are at times uh, specifically legal and at times uh, specifically narrative, usually theological because Jewish theology in the Bible is presented in a narrative form and their interconnection of the two. Uh, this is something that she is very well qualified to deal with uh, because of her uh, background and knowledge of, uh, of the Jewish tradition, both uh, legal and theological, uh, and their interaction uh, and interconnection, uh, but also uh, because this uh, is an important uh, topic uh, that came to the attention of uh, scholars and students in many different fields by a landmark article that was written in 1983 by the late uh, legal scholar, uh, Robert Cover of Yale University. Um, there, his article, uh, Nomos and Narrative, Law and Narrative, was also based on the connection of Halakha and Agada. And this article uh, has been cited uh, an incredible number of times. I, I checked it out. Uh, and therefore, Robert Cover set the stage for the discussion of Jewish law and theology uh, in a wider uh, context. Now, usually, uh, scholars of Jewish law who get involved in general jurisprudential questions uh, are very learned people um, who try to show uh, how Jewish law had dealt with certain problems that are dealt with in, let's say, in, in American jurisprudence. Um, what Suzanne Stone does over and above that is to show how the study of general jurisprudence or American jurisprudence influences the way we interpret the Jewish tradition, both legal and theological. In other words, it's not just what Judaism offered it, uh, as past president, but what Judaism offers to present discussion and what present discussion uh, reverberates back 
and causes us to look at the Jewish tradition uh, with uh, renewed eyes. So without further comment uh, on uh, Suzanne Stone as a person and as a scholar, and without further comment on her fascinating talk that we are going to hear, uh, I turn the floor over, the virtual floor over to Professor Stone. David, thank you so much for both the generous and astute comments you just made. I really appreciate it. And um, yes, I'm glad you translated my title because I am going to talk about Halakha and Agadah very extensively, uh, though not quite as much about law and theology, a little bit. Uh, and I'm also glad that you praised me for my collaborative discussions with students because as a way of apology, I must say that collaborative discussion is my favorite way of communicating, not lecture. Uh, so bear with me as I try a form uh, that isn't really um, as congenial as a back and forth conversation. Uh, my topic is norms and narrative, or as David put it, halakha and agada. Now, in general, the relationship of halakha to other expressions of Jewish culture, and we could include in this agada, philosophy, and Kabbalah, is complex. That is, traditionally, we have viewed these different bodies of work, different sorts of cultural expressions, as accompaniments to the law. That is, each in diverse ways provided an explanatory system for the law, rationale for the commandments, and it imbued the commandments with spiritual, ethical, and intellectual meaning. But these cultural expressions, whether Agadah, philosophy, or Kabbalah, do not, according to the traditional viewpoint, intrude on the law's autonomy. Now, the relationship of Agadah to Halakha has always been far tighter than that of philosophy or Kabbalah. Agadah, after all, right, is produced often by the same scholastic circles that engage in the legal disputations recorded in the Mishnah and Talmud. And Agadot are freely woven into the legal discussion. Indeed, close to 40% of the Babylonian Talmud consists of material classifiable as Agadah. The Babylonian Talmud is regarded, moreover, as a canonical body of work. And the authority granted to the Babylonian Talmud arguably extends to the Agadah contained in it. But most importantly, and this we will come back to at length in the lecture, the very division of the early rabbinic and Talmudic output into two separate bodies of knowledge. That is one body of knowledge, the halakha, concerned with clearly delineated rules of conduct or decision-making, and the other, agadah, concerned with speculations about God, man, and the world, is in fact a post-Talmudic development. And for that reason, the question persists whether Agadah plays a legal role in the Talmudic tradition. And the question is all the more pertinent today because there has been a notable turn to Agadah as well as to biblical narratives as a legal source in contemporary halachic writings, particularly in areas where the, there is a paucity of more conventional halachic sources. So in my talk today, what I will emphasize is how familiar jurisprudential debates about what is law have implicitly shaped internal attitudes toward Agadah as a legal source. And I will argue that both the traditional and academic resistance to acknowledging Agadah's legal role has suffered from narrowly viewing halakha and law in general through the prism of positivism and formalism. The codificatory movement in law and halakha 
the hardening of the idea of law with the rise of the modern state as rule governance rather than norm guidance, as well as the rise of religious styles within Judaism that placed conceptual legal analysis at the heart of the religious quest, all contributed to this narrow prism. And as far afield as it might at first blush seem, I will draw instead on one of positivism's rivals, the Anglo-American common law tradition to help illuminate some of the legal roles of Agadah. So I thought I would begin with a very brief introduction to Agadah, just in case within the audience, there are some who are not familiar with the genre. Uh, the Agadah reflects the world and thought of the Talmudic sages. The ideas of the Agadah are presented in a wide variety of narrative forms. They consist of homilies, legends about biblical figures, myths, fables, stories of the doings of rabbis, folk sayings, theological speculation, and more. Because Agadah is so diverse and so eclectic in both literary form and subject matter, by far the most common modern definition of Agadah has simply been a negative one. As the 19th century academic scholar Leopold Zunz put it, the Agadah is, quote, that which is not halakha, unquote. Halakha and Agadah appear together in all the early rabbinic collections, Mishnah, Tosefta, the halachic midrashim, and the two Talmuds. But as David mentioned, the Hebrew Bible itself is a mix of legal prescriptions, historical narratives, poetry, prophetic speeches, and parables. And thus the Bible provides a model and explanation for this freewheeling combination of disparate genres in a single work. Whether the legal and narrative material of the Hebrew Bible can be meaningfully separated from one another is a question often raised internally within the Jewish tradition and externally by biblical scholars. While the standard internal viewpoint is that the narrative material of the Bible, like Agadah, is not, quote, law, unquote, there is an extremely close connection between the two genres. The book of Genesis, which is almost exclusively narrative, details the prehistory of Israel from creation of the world to the lives of the forefathers of Israel until the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Yet Genesis assumes a world of law. Cain is punished for murder. The generation of the flood is obliterated for wrongdoing. Contracts are made, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And both the Talmudic rabbis and later authorities squeeze norms out of the narratives. Moreover, there is a deep thematic interplay between biblical law and biblical narrative. For example, the sabbatical laws and even the time period in which a Hebrew slave may remain enslaved are tied to the account of God's creation, while laws about proper treatment of strangers and foreign slaves are tied to the account of Israel's exodus from Egypt. As the biblical scholar Edward Greenstein put it, law and narrative remain two separate genres, but in a general way, they teach the same values and the same principles can be deduced out of and underlie both. The same may be said about the formative period of Jewish law. Studies have shown how the laws of the Mishnah concerning execution and also prayer are framed around ideas made more transparent in narratives emanating from the same Tanaite schools. The analytic units of the Babylonian Talmud are interrupted by long sections of Agadah that are thematically related to the subject at hand. Often the thrust of the legal argumentation seems to point in one normative direction, while the Agadah attached to the analytic unit points in precisely the opposite normative direction. The Mishnah and Talmud are famous for recording dissenting legal opinions. And in these instances, the Agadah seems to function as a dissenting opinion in the form of a narrative. In short, the Bible and the Talmudic tradition evince a commitment to communicate and discuss norms in two very different ways.
through relatively clear statements and logical argumentation and through concrete, contextual, personal, and sometimes fantastical examples or stories. A concrete example of the close relationship of Halakha and Agadah, especially for those unfamiliar with Agadah, is one of the most cited narratives in the Babylonian Talmud, known as the story of the oven of Achnai. I, put, I gave you an excerpt of it um, in a Word document, along with some other sources that we'll come to. And for those who want to follow along with the text, you can open up the document in your chat. But I'll read it so you don't have to. So the Agadah tells about a momentous event that occurred during the convocation of sages at Yavne. We learned, goes the Agadah, if one cut the oven into separate tiles and placed sand between each tile, Rabbi Eliezer declared it clean and the sages unclean. This was the oven of Achnai. Why Achnai, said Rabbi Judah in the name of Samuel. It is because they encircled it with arguments like a snake and declared it unclean. It was taught. On that day, Rabbi Eliezer replied with all the arguments in the world, but they did not accept them from him. He said to them, if the halacha agrees with me, this carob tree will prove it. The carob tree was uprooted a hundred cubits from its place, and some say 400 cubits. They said to him, no proof may be brought from the carob tree. He said, then said to them, if the halacha agrees with me, the aqueduct will prove it. The water thereupon flowed backwards. No proof may be brought from an aqueduct, they said to him. Said he in turn, if the halacha agrees with me, the walls of the house of study will prove it. The walls of the house of study started to fall. However, Rabbi Joshua rebuked them saying, if scholars debate one another about the halacha, what concern is it of yours? They did not fall down out of respect for Rabbi Joshua, but did not stand up straight out of respect for Rabbi Yehud. They are still inclining. Then he said to them, if the halacha agrees with me, heaven will prove it. A bat kol, a divine voice went forth and said, what have you against Rabbi Eliezer for the halacha agrees with him everywhere. Then Rabbi Joshua stood up on his feet and said, it is not in heaven, quoting Deuteronomy. What does it is not in heaven mean? Said Rabbi Jeremiah, the Torah has already been given at Mount Sinai and one pays no attention to a voice from heaven. For you have already written on Mount Sinai in your law, quote, after the majority must one incline. Rabbi Nathan met Elijah and asked him, what did the Holy One blessed be he do in that hour? He replied, he smiled and said, my children have defeated me, my children have defeated me. Now the above passage, which I'm really so popular, I'm sure you all know, is a small section of a longer unit. It makes its appearance immediately after a discussion whether in the time of the sages, the gates of heaven are now closed. In other words, is direct communication with the divine still possible? One opinion states that only the gates of wounded feelings remain open. And it is this statement that occasions the introduction of the Agadah. In the continuation of the story, the Agadah relates that Rabban Gamliel excommunicated Rabbi Eliezer for continuing to rule in accordance with his views, despite the majority decision of the sages. Rabban Gamliel is nearly swept away at sea and saved in the last instance when he cries to heaven that he excommunicated Rabbi Eliezer so that disputes would not multiply in Israel. The coda of the narrative returns to the theme of wounded feelings. Rabbi Eliezer's wife, who is also Rabban Gamliel's sister, is reported to go to great lengths to prevent her husband from crying out about his wounded feelings. But she is unfortunately distracted for a moment. And in that instant, Rabbi Eliezer cries out and Rabban Gamliel is struck dead. Now the literary elements of this Agadah are remarkable, but of course what concerns me is its legal elements. The precise legal question posed is whether prophecy Divine communication about the law, to which, for example, Moses resorted in the Bible, 
can be taken into account in halachic decision-making. Rabbi Eli Ezwer, elsewhere in the Talmudic corpus, is a sage who, is put, who is, bases his opinions, according to the Talmudic portrayal, on received legal tradition. And in accordance with his received tradition, the oven was ritually clean. The majority of sages held the view, most likely based on argumentation rather than tradition, a methodological dispute, that the oven was unclean. At this point, Rabbi Eliezer invokes a variety of miracles to persuade the sages that he is correct, culminating in the proclamation by a voice from heaven that Rabbi Eliezer's opinion is the correct halacha. And it's in the face of this declaration that Rabbi Joshua replies, the law is not in heaven. As later explained, once the Torah was revealed, the law was handed over for human deliberation and controversies are settled by majority consensus. Now stripped of all the miraculous doings and God's laughing acquiescence, elements so characteristic of Agadah, the passage presents a succinct statement about legal truth and validity. I once had occasion to debate um, with Ronald Dworkin, a legal philosopher who I will mention in a little while, and um, I asked him to speak about Jewish law, which he knew zero about, but he was a very, very good sport, and I sent him this passage, and he said, aha, it's my theory. It's all about truth and validity. It is, in fact, a clear jurisprudential cornerstone of the halacha, and Maimonides codifies the basic principle that prophecy has no role in halachic deliberation and reasoning, right? Citing the same scriptural proof texts invoked in the Agadic passage and giving them the same non-literal interpretation. So here's one puzzle. Is this Agadah the source of rabbinic authority to disregard prophecy? Or is it a marvelous account of rabbinic authority? In other words, is the Agadah a statement of law and a legal source? Or is it a statement about the law and thus legal theory? Right? Other jurisprudential puzzles abound. Agadic tales about the conduct of exemplary figures could be viewed as narrative precedents from which rules can be extracted and formulated, as we will shortly discuss, a process very familiar to anyone right, who is a common law denizen. Finally, numerous agotic passages, as well as scriptural verses, convey very broad-based, open-ended values and principles, such as creation in the image of God or respect for human dignity. Do these principles have independent legal force or are they merely summaries, general expressions of pre-existing concrete rules? Could one generate new rules from the principles and the values the Agadah convey? Can these principles overcome specific rules when the principles and the rules point in different directions? For example, the idea of creation in the image of God, a biblical principle, Right? enhanced and elaborated on in countless Angadic passages, provides the conceptual underpinning of a variety of laws, both those concerning modes of execution, the respect accorded to corpses, etc. The concrete rules are startlingly sparse, however, especially given the weight of this principle. Can the principle serve to generate new norms or override pre-existing norms? All of these questions, the answer to them depends on trying to understand whether agada in some way is a legal source. So let us review both the traditional viewpoint, right? And then some explanations for it and challenges to it. That agada is not law was first articulated in the post-Talmudic Gaonic period. And since then, the refrain, we do not learn halacha from the Agadah, has been a convention within internal Jewish legal practice. Today, in traditional yeshiva circles devoted to the study of halacha, for example, the Agadah is hardly studied. 
So before engaging in a reassessment of the legal status of agada, it is important that we understand the basis for the Gaonic denial of legal authority to agada. The distinction between halacha and agada is only hinted at within the Talmudic corpus itself. In the Palestinian Talmud, Rabbi Zera, in the name of Shmuel, is quoted as saying that one does not make a decision on the basis of the halachot, hakadot, and tosafot. This statement recognizes that there are a, plural, a plurality of genres relevant to decision making, but does not relegate the Agadah to a secondary status. According to another Talmudic statement, the Agadis does not forbid or permit, proclaim unclean, or proclaim clean. But this statement may merely be describing what an Agadis usually does. In the Gaonic period, however, the dictum, which is apparently that of Sadja Gaon, that one does not rely on Agadah gain currency. The post-Talmudic Geonim asserted that Haggadah should not be relied on nor questioned. And as Joseph Heinemann states, since the days of Shmuel HaNagid, the negative definition of Agadah, that is non-legal material was accepted. Heinemann notably includes in the definition of Agadah any material with narrative qualities. Now, the Gaonim articulated both jurisprudential and theological rationales for this view. The jurisprudential objection takes aim at the narrative form of Agadah, precisely, while the theological objection takes aim at the actual content of the Agadah. Those who articulated a jurisprudential objection identified the defect of the Agadah in its departure from a rule-like form. The Agadah is fluid in its details, often conveying multiple perspectives, utilizing more freewheeling interpretive canons when interpreting scripture. And as a result, the singular quality of rules in which outcomes follow rules in relatively straightforward and predictable fashion is lacking. In the words of Rav Haigaon, it should be known that the words of the Agadah do not have the status of oral tradition, shmu'ah, and each person conjectures as he pleases, employing such terms as perhaps and it could be said, so that the issues are not clearly defined. For that reason, we cannot rely upon them. The theological objection to the Agadah as a source of law or legal reasoning is aimed primarily at the anthropomorphic conception of God appearing in numerous agadot. God laughs and concedes defeat, as in the story I just read to you. God learns Torah, dons phylacteries. The Shmuel ben Chafni Gaon remark, where the words of the early authorities contradict intellectual perception, we are not obliged to accept them. In a certain way, the theological objection cuts even deeper than the jurisprudential one, because it denies Agada authority even as theology. Right? As one scholar noted, Halakha and Agada, especially the obscure Agada, are no longer seen as occupying the same ideational world. They cannot even serve in this view as an explanatory system accompanying the Halakha. They cannot serve to delineate the purposes or principles behind the rules. Yet if the primary objection is theological and content-based, only some agadot are disqualified. In an intriguing study, Professor Brachyahu Lifshitz argued that the original objection right, was content-based, especially in the Talmud. Dershe Hagadot say, if you wish to know him who spoke and the world came into being, study Haggadah, for thereby you will come to know him and cling to his ways. Other passages similarly suggest that the relevant division is between the actions and nature of God described in Haggadah, 
and human obligations, which is the concern, as we usually understand it, of the halakha. In other words, the division between halakha and agada rests not on its narrative versus rule-like form, but on its content. Agada that is metaphysical, right, or ontology, as opposed to normative guidance, are not the stuff of halakha. If this thesis is correct, much of what we classify as agada today, based on its narrative form, was never intended to be excluded from the legal corpus because its subject matter is not metaphysics or the nature of God, but rather the scope of human obligations. These narratives are simply an unusual genre of reflection on human obligations from which legal knowledge and normative guidance might very possibly be extracted. And I will be arguing shortly that this genre is far less unusual than we might suppose. The Gaonic objection that takes aim at the form of Agadot, at their lack of framing in rule-like form and failure to offer clear-cut guidance is not so easily dismissed, however. We expect law to speak with a large degree of clarity and precision. So but we certainly do today. Expressing law in clear rules is part and parcel of the ideal of the modern Western rule of law, an ideal that cabins judicial whim by insisting that judges follow the rules laid down and that preserves individual freedom by insisting that law clearly demarcate between authorized and non-authorized conduct. If law is a closed system of rules, law as per Weber becomes a formal operation. Judges in applying rules do not exercise discretion. The rules do the work, unless the law and not the judge governs. That is our ideal of the rule of law. Now, while the Jewish legal system vests far more trust in judges than modern legal system, and accords them far more authority to depart from rules, other aspects of the halacha heighten the need for rules. As Moshe Silberg long ago pointed out, the halacha primarily addresses ordinary people who are performing the law on a daily and even hourly basis without court intervention or judicial instruction. To perform the law, to know what are one's obligations, requires that the law be stated with precision and clarity. Since the post-Talmudic Gaonic period, the paradigm picture of halacha is just this set of rules, a picture that culminated in the project of codification. And modern researchers who thought about the question of halacha and agada, like Zunz and Heinemann, did so within a setting where positivism, that idea that law is a pedigreed set of rules, authoritative directives, hierarchically arranged, increasingly dominated the, lang the landscape. And so it seemed very natural to them to define agada with its non-rule-like outer form as not law. Nevertheless, rules can be embedded in stories and squeezed out or inferred from them and norm guidance does not need to take the form of clear-cut rules, directives, statutes, and codes. The classical common law, which consists um, entirely of judicial cases, is one example. And theories of law emanating from common law legal traditions, especially those that insist law is not restricted to rules, but also encompasses principles have opened up new ways to understand and describe how agada at times functions as law in Talmudic literature and increasingly as a legal source in the contemporary period. Now, common law is not simply the name of a particular legal tradition, that is the Anglo-American legal tradition. Common law is a style of legal thought and reasoning, and it characterizes many legal systems, 
that have not been fully absorbed into the apparatus of the modern state. The ground for conceptual comparison of the Talmudic tradition and common law also lies in a variety of structural similarities that bear mentioning. Both emphasize a strong judiciary, a jurist class, and a weak or even non-existent legislature. Both have very comparable social institutions. Each emphasized a form of apprenticeship in which students sit at the feet of their masters and absorb the technique of innovation within tradition. We could also compare the social institution of the common law inns, where jurists slept and dined together for long periods of time, trading cases and hypotheticals that served to unify the law despite a high degree of decentralized practice. And we should compare them perhaps to the periodic gatherings of the rabbis, the archaikala, and even to the responsa literature that created a virtual republic of letters. Both the common law and the Talmudic tradition primarily emphasized the argumentative and discursive structure of legal practice. And most important for current purposes, the common law is a jurisprudence of stories in which narratives are central to legal reasoning. So let me elaborate a bit more deeply about the common law style of legal reasoning in the hope that it can provide an analytic category for reassessing the role of narratives in rabbinic legal reasoning. Classic, classical Anglo-American common law consists entirely of cases. These are narratives, stories, if you will. They are extended descriptions of people interacting with a judgment attached to them. This jurisprudence of stories serves as a vehicle for reasoning about unwritten rules. Rules are extracted from the story of social interaction and often even applied to the very case from which they have been extracted. Often a rule extracted from one narrative is reformulated in light of comparison to other stories, whether real, actual decided cases, or imagined, that is, hypotheticals. Contrary to popular imagination, which treats prior decided cases as binding precedents on the order of a codified rule or statute, the classical common law viewed prior cases and even parliamentary legislation as no more nor less authoritative than hypotheticals, right? Narratives were a means to explore the ambit of a rule and these rules might be unwritten. The attitude to narratives is thus intimately tied to a notion that rules are taken up, they're not laid down. Rules are constantly in the process of formulation, acceptance, rejection, revision, in light of the particulars and concreteness that the narratives provide, as well as the principles discerned from the narratives as they accrue over time. Principles that differ from rules in that they have great weight, but they lack the all or nothing quality of rules. This style of legal reasoning, of testing generally formulated rules against particulars provided by stories of social interaction is preserved, of course, in the modern legal classroom, which is dominated by hypotheticals, often framed around stories that are plucked from the cultural air and elaborated so as to border on the absurd or fantastical. Strikingly, the defects of the Agadah as a source of law identified by the Gaonim are echoed in the charges that Hobbes and Bentham slung at the historical and persisting Anglo-American common law. The common law is a philosophy or disputable art, not law, Hobbes wrote. The common law is merely a thing imaginary, Bentham added. For whatever the alleged rules of common law are, they cannot be rules of law, right? If one believes with Hobbes that it is not wisdom but authority that makes a law, or with Bentham that law provides normative guidance in a very specific way by issuing authoritative clear-cut directives, 
to the citizens it seeks to govern, then common law is not law. For as one very astute philosopher of the common law put it, common law denies that command, sanction, authorized institutions, or even clarity is theoretically central to law. Instead, common law directs attention to the normative guidance law seeks to provide, not through command, but through institutionalizing a collaborative argument over norms. The classical common law was not interested in theory. Like their Talmudic counterparts, they never engaged in systematic writing. But the legal philosopher Ronald Dworkin remains the best articulator of the theory of law and style of legal reasoning that characterized the common law, albeit with a modern Protestant twist that elevates the heroic judge over the collaborative argument emphasized by classical common law. Dworkin's first major intervention in legal theory, that principles are embedded in the legal tradition along with rules, and that weighing principles along with rules calls for decisions that are always interpretive, is a reworking of the common law style of legal reasoning in light of more contemporary concerns about judicial law. In parsing law as an interpretive concept, moreover, Dworkin shows us that law is not a text so much as it is a social practice, right? It moves the law from being about a settled fact or a matter of a past decision, that's positivism, to ongoing argument and deliberation. The exercise and interpretation is impossible unless law is a social practice that involves its participants in arguing over the purpose or point of the practice. Values and purposes then are not outside the legal tradition in this conception of law. They're not external to the law. They are not extra legal sources. They are rather embedded in the accumulated past of the tradition and retrieved from within. Dworkin's insistence that values and principles are not outside the legal tradition, not explanations or factors external to the law, is motivated by several concerns, but the most salient of them for our purposes, to use Dworkin's terminology, is that law never runs out because rules do not exhaust the law. What I would like to do now is to look at two agaric passages with you. Each highlights a distinctive feature prominent in common law styles of legal reasoning. The first deals with extracting and reformulating rules in light of narratives, and the second with the interaction of rules and principles. My first example, which you can see on the second page of the Word document that I disseminated that is in your chat, is a well-known agada about a first century figure, Choni Ham Agel. The tale appeals, appears several times in Talmudic literature in different versions, but its first appearance is in the Mishnaic tractate dealing with the laws of public prayer. While Choni is remembered as the miracle worker who drew a circle and refused to leave it until God produced rain, the story also details that he prayed for the rain to cease in seeming violation of the Mishnah's rule in Tanit, which appears immediately before the narrative, which forbids public prayers for rain to cease. The relationship of the Choni story to the Mishnaic rule in the Mishnah is complex because the rule Choni performs in the narrative is slightly ambiguous as narratives are wont to be, but if we pay attention to the details of the story, we can extract a rule from the narrative. The rule that Choni performs is as follows. One may pray for the ceasing of torrential rain, but not rain that is merely burdensome. While perfectly sensible, praying for torrential rain to cease is however, a clear violation of the literal phrasing of the Mishnaic halacha. In the Mishnaic account, it is unclear whether the narrative 
is attached to the legal rule to function as an attacking hypothetical, a legal descent cast in narrative form, because the story contains conflicting assessments of Choni. He's a holy man, a familiar of God, yet Shimon ben Shetach censures him. The role of the story in the later Talmudic discussion of the Mishnaic rule is easier to pinpoint. The Palestinian Talmud follows, takes a very literal approach to the Mishnaic rule. It forbids praying for rain to cease, even in cases of torrential rain that pose a danger to life, and it supplies a theological rationale for the rule. God promised never to revisit a flood, and so praying for rain to cease is tantamount to impugning God's promise. A version of the story of Choni is then cited, but in this version, there are subtle alterations and interpolations, and Choni is portrayed more or less as a villain. By contrast, the Babylonian Talmud, whose text you also have, completely reworks the Mishnaic rule, so that is it, it is in fact in conformity with the rule performed by Choni. That is, the Agadah here is doing legal work. Thus, the Bavli explains the rule of the Mishnah as forbidding prayer over an excess of good with rain but one example. Pursuant to this reformulation of the rule, one may pray for torrential rain to cease, just as Choni did, though not burdensome rain. And in the version of the Choni narrative appearing in the Bavli, Choni is exalted. Throughout the course of the citation of the narrative in the Talmudic corpus, the intimate connection between the rule and narratives is preserved through a subtle rewriting of the facts of the narrative, just as prior cases are subtly revised and retold in the common law, so as to emerge as precedents for a reformulated rule. My second example turns to the topic of rules and principles, and it is drawn from the Agatha commentary on 2 Samuels 21, and it is the final um, source that's cited for you in the Word document I provided in chat, right? And it recounts the hanging of Saul's sons uh, pursuant to the demand of the Gibeonites. The biblical narrative is a story of three reconciliations between God and Israel, between the people of Israel and the Gibeonites, a minority group living on the land who charged that King David's predecessor Saul had caused their death, a strife within the polity, and between the house of David and the house of Saul, a strife within the Israelite community. The story begins with a famine, moves to the dramatic moment when David acquiesces in the Gibeonites' demand for enacting retribution against the sons of Saul, since Saul is already dead, and ends with David's burial of Saul's bones, at which point the famine is lifted. The passage in the Babylonian Talmud is morally complex and multi multifaceted. It deserves a separate lecture. It is launched in response to a Mishnah that excludes the Nitinim identified with the Gibeonites from the community of Israel. The Talmud locates the source of the Mishnaic ruling in King David's decree. And the Bavli exploits this tradition to make a point of the differing expectations and obligations of Israel toward all the citizens in a polity, providing justice for wrongs, and of members of a covenantal community toward one another, exercising mercy and waiving rights. I focus here only on the Bavli's evaluation of King David's decision to hand over Saul's sons for execution. That decision goes against the grain of the Bavli's general antipathy toward collective punishment and efforts to establish individual accountability and punishment as the norm. The early rabbis inherited an equivocal legacy from the Hebrew Bible but it's quite clear that the trend of the Talmudic tradition is to uphold individual accountability. Yet the Bavli is also committed to the correctness of David's decision. After all, in the end, the divine anger was appeased, the Bible reports. 
Moreover, in the Talmudic tradition, David is a figure of one who exercises righteous judgment. In this sense, the biblical narrative is akin to a precedent, an account or a case, the common law case, an account of social interaction that includes an evaluation or judgment of the action. The agudic resolution pits rules against principles. Here, individual punishment, which is transformed into a rule in this very place, right? It is denominated the letter of the law in this very narrative versus the principles of avoiding desecration of the name and of sanctifying name. Better that a letter of the Torah should be uprooted than profanation of the name occur, the text recites. For onlookers were now marveling at the punishment meted out to princes to avenge a wrong committed against a bedraggled minority population and promptly converting. Now the narrative is also a subtle exploration of the larger topic of the Bavli Sugya or analytic unit, the rabbinic power to uproot Torah law and its limits. For our purposes here, the importance of the narrative is that it makes the tension between rules and principles explicit and seems to treat both as components of a decision with principles having weight and therefore able to overcome rules. Indeed, the narrative might be said to offer a classroom lesson on the process of legal reasoning and decision-making with the decision deflected onto King David in a system composed of interacting rules and principles. I'm mindful of the time, and so I am going to skip to the contemporary period um, and bear with me for just one moment as I skip that part of my lecture that dealt with the post-Talmudic reception of the Ga'onim, particularly uh, in Maimonides. And I'll move as quickly as I can instead, right, to the contemporary period. Because one of the most striking aspects of contemporary halachic writings, especially those authored within religious Zionist circles, is a startling appearance of Agadah and biblical narratives. Many of these writings are a response to crisis. The return of Jews to sovereignty in the 20th century posed considerable challenge for Jewish legal decisors. There was no continuous legal tradition addressing the laws of war, the obligations of a sovereign Jewish government, or even the legitimacy of a secular Jewish parliament and court system. Long neglected legal sources were marshaled, right? And applied to present day questions, right? But these laws were relatively sparse and there was no halachic tradition of continuous application testing and refinement of the rules in concrete circumstances. One could respond to this challenge in different ways and so did legal decisors. In general, ultra-traditionalists adhered to older patterns of halachic thought and largely neglected the new topics. Right? From an ideological perspective, they did not assign independent religious value to the creation of a Jewish sovereign state, right? nor were matters of affairs of state pressing for the community. The question of the legitimacy of the state and its institutions could be settled instead by drawing on familiar patterns developed when living in exile under non-Jewish rulership, and military matters could be analogized by subsuming war to halachic rules on individual aggression and defense, that is, by way of analogy. From a jurisprudential perspective, right, if a transcendent force, right, great weight is assigned to the continuous spiral of argument within the legal tradition, a subject lacking such a continuous spiral is best avoided and better to look at analogical forms of reasoning. In sharp contrast, rabbis within the religious Zionist segment treated the novel reality as a paradigm shift. They sought to fashion new collective obligation and, and rights that could be applied to the new entity. And they insisted that the halacha must be a part of the general Jewish cultural renaissance. Therefore, they rejected 
proposed halakhic solutions that rested on the incorporation by reference of international or foreign law. Rather, the halakha must supply an indigenous and innovative solution, a culturally specific Jewish response to novel questions. It's in this context that halakhic decisors increasingly turn to novel sources. A sermon by the prominent Talmudic commentator, Rav Nissim Garandi, that had become a focus for contemporary debate about the halakhic legitimacy of separating religion and state in a contemporary Jewish state, is cited and re-described by Rabbi Chaim Grzynski as a responsum, a legal source. Most often, rabbis within the religious camp, Zionist camp turned to Agadah and biblical narrative and fashioned law directly out of them. Many of these narratives, if the Bible at least, are set within the context of the biblical polity and therefore provide a rough analogy for a modern Jewish state. Right? And so the Agadah also becomes a part of this. And these writings illustrate both that the Gaonic interdiction is not followed into the breach, but also that there's something to the Gaonic interdiction. That is, right, the, the fluidity and ambiguity of narratives and open-ended principles such as be holy, right, in contrast to clearly de delineated rules, can be interpreted in many directions. Often they are interpreted in ways that demand heightened ethical sensibilities, but among more militant streams within religious Zionism, a very different meaning is given to the idea of holiness, which valorizes extreme aggression. The story of the Gibeonites that I spoke about just before provides another example of the contemporary fashioning of rules of conduct from Agadah. And I'm not gonna go into the details because I am looking at the time and mindful of the fact that I have hopefully just another few moments, five more minutes, right? But I um, will point out that um, that narrative becomes a precedent, right? For an obligation to provide sustenance to all resident strangers or permanent residents, no matter how hostile the population may be. It's a striking feature of a responsum authored by Rabbi Halevi on this very topic in that he gives a very sympathetic portrayal of the Gibeonites. In that way, in some ways, he's not that far from the biblical text itself, which has been quite obscured by later commentary. And he writes, about them. The matter pained them greatly and justifiably so, and that's why they were not able to forgive the injustice that was perpetrated against them. These rabbinic writings are a far cry from the formal analysis that so characterizes a positivist depiction right, of the halachic process. One might dismiss this turn as a transitory response to a moment of crisis. Yet the Agadah seems to resurface whenever analogies really fall short. Paradigmatic changes, such as new technologies about artificial intelligence, are also ripe areas for the use of Agadah, and we see it happening right as we speak. There are two related instincts at work. It's inconceivable, to use Dworkin's term, that the halakha simply runs out. And second, one needs to squeeze out halachic information wherever it can be found. And now to my conclusion. The authority ostensibly denied to Agadah is not merely a technical question within Jewish law or a jurisprudential puzzle. It is a symbol of a much larger debate over both over Judaism as a religion of law and not spirit, and over the nature of Judaism in modernity. While well, halakha has always occupied a central role in the definition of the Jewish religion, halakha has not always been the exclusive definition of the Jewish religious quest. In the Talmudic literature itself, the study of Agadah is described as the means to attain knowledge of God. In the medieval period, Maimonides declared 
knowledge of God, the primary religious aim, and philosophy, the means to attain it. Right? The rise of a modern Jewish cultural identity has breathed new life into Agadah as literature and into Jewish philosophy and Kabbalah. For the first time, these cultural expressions stand on their own. They are no longer explanatory systems of the halakha, but rather independent means to achieve a Jewish cultural identity. In his now classic essay, Halakha and Agadah, the Hebrew poet Chaim Nachman Bialik sought to achieve a reintegration of Halakha and Agadah. He wrote that Halakha and Agadah are two facets of the same creature. Halakha is the crystallization of Agadah and relates to it as speech is to thought and emotion or as fruit to the flower. That is Agadah's halacha in Patentia. But he also described them as a study in contrast, one severe and the other compliant, merciful, softer as oil. For Bialik, halacha and Agadah served as heuristic devices intended to capture two cultural models Jews inherited and he called on Hebrew literature to retrieve both, the practical concrete, interested in the here and now, and the joyous imaginative abstract. Neither model, the dry legalistic Judaism of the ritual status of ovens and the imaginative life of God laughing exist in a vacuum. Rather, the two were in productive tension with one another and paradoxically interdependent. Nearly a century later, on a separate continent, the American legal scholar Robert Cover penned a remarkable essay that David alluded to before, Nomos and Narrative, that breathed new life into Bialik's evocation of Halakha and Agadah as in tension with one another, yet paradoxically interdependent. Cover was speaking about the American legal tradition and not the Talmudic tradition, although the Jewish tradition was an intellectual resource for him. In the essay, he outlined two models of law, the imperial and the paideic, and he portrayed them as studies in contrast, yet interdependent. One was concerned with law as a means to preserve social order through the enforcement of clearly delineated rules of conduct. The other was culturally specific, expressive, aspirational, and perfectionist, and drew its, st its strength from the culture's narratives. These narratives were the more transparent repository of the principles and values of the community embedded in the law that legal interpretation aimed to achieve. Not a few readers of Nomus and Narrative read the essay as an extended comment on law and literature and explicitly took its title to be a reference to Halakha and Agadah using the standard negative definition of Agadah, that which is not law. But Cover's Paideia is a model of law, and in many ways a plea to recapture the common law roots of American law, in which the Constitution is read as a set of principles and not a code or super statute, and the Declaration of Independence as a background legal text. And this returns us to the central question this talk has gr grappled with. Does Agadah have a role to play beyond the intellectual, spiritual, or aesthetic as a this-worldly resource for fashioning halakha? Thank you. <laughs>